Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. I am Emily Hart. I am the E-Rate and Director Connections Consultant here with the Bureau of Library Development. It's part of the Division of Library and Information Services. One of the things that I am so excited to introduce to you guys here today is a tool uh, that will help you as library professionals um, become more familiar and comfortable with gauging your library's current and future needs as regard to your internet connectivity. I have the great privilege of introducing Stephanie Stenberg and Carson Block from the Toward Gigabit Libraries and Gigabit Libraries and Beyond project uh, that has been published. And they're going to be talking about this amazing self-paced and self-directed toolkit with you guys here today. I really feel that this will help Florida's libraries become, uh, and library staff become much more familiar with what the internet and connectivity capabilities of your institutions are and can be in the future, especially as we're moving towards new phases of funding and connectivity needs. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over now to Stephanie and Carson. Thank you guys so much for joining us here today. Thanks so much for having us, Emily. We're just so excited um, for this. And let me see if I am if my screen is displaying. Can you all see that okay? Yes. Wonderful. Well, we wouldn't be here without the Institute of Museum and Library Services, um, which has provided grant funding for our project. And I just wanted to say thank you to them for that. Um, we're here today to talk to you about the Tor Gigabit Libraries Toolkit and the Gigabit Libraries and Beyond Grant Project. And those are two projects that are um, connected and we'll explain a little more in a minute. Um, but my name is Stephanie Stenberg. I'm the director of the Internet to Community Anchor Program. And I'll explain what that is in a little bit. And my partner in crime is Carson Block. Say hi, Carson. Hey, hey Stephanie. Thank you so much. It is so wonderful to be here. Uh, we are your project managers and we cannot wait to tell you about this wonderful project. We also want to pay tribute to our uh, our founding team. I was part of a group of three of us uh, earlier. Uh, we want to say thank you so much to the to the late and the great James Worley, who was part of the founding uh, team, and Susanna Spellman, who uh, is alive and well and working in the private sector now. But but uh, we wanted to say thank you for their work because this is a continuation of a project that's been along, been around for quite a while now. The Towards Gigabit Libraries Toolkit is something awesome, something you can print, something you can carry with you, something you can scribble up, and something that will help you learn about your technology in your library. Uh, it's free, it's uh, downloadable, you can take it, you can remix it, you can do other stuff with it, but what most people do is use it to have a better understanding of their current broadband infrastructure, their current technology equipment, and the IT environment. We also have this thing called the Broadband Improvement Plan, and that is the actions that you can take after you have gone through the toolkit. It helps you become a stronger advocate for uh, your library's needs, and it helps you know what you need. That's one of the most important parts about it. The Toolkit started in 2015. We had an IMLS grant. It was a two-year grant developed um, uh, to develop training curriculum and self-assessment material. That's what we're calling the toolkit for library broadband infrastructure. And this was targeted just at very rural, very small, and tribal libraries in the US. Our partners included state library networks and research and education networks, RE networks. If you don't know what those are, don't worry. We're going to tell you what those are in a minute. Now, our initial pilot uh, goal, the pilot, was to uh, do it in 30 libraries just to see if it would work. We put our heads down. We were able to get uh, 60 libraries, and we also had a uh, one-year extension on that program. It, we didn't uh, charge any extra uh, fees or, or any, we didn't need any extra money to do that, but we, uh, we were able to visit so many more libraries than we originally anticipated. So that first grant developed the 61-page um, toolkit that um, 
you're able to download for free today. And then in September of 2020, we were awarded a second two-year grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services called Gigabit Libraries and Beyond. And the idea about this grant is to actually take the Tor Gigabit Libraries toolkit, work on it to improve it with experts across the nation and expand the reach throughout the United States. Now, the original toolkit, as Carson said, targeted rural and tribal libraries. We're also going to be working on expanding the toolkit's reach to address the needs of urban libraries in what you know you might call a tech desert as well for this. So um, before we tell you a little bit more about a toolkit, we're going to tell you, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Internet 2, um, which is where I work, and then we'll tell you a little bit about um, Carson Block Consulting, where Carson works as well. So Internet 2 is actually, um, was founded by the nation's leader high, higher, leading higher education institutions in 1996. And so what it did is it actually created this internet backbone across the United States. Um, internet 2 is a nonprofit, um, and it does connect um, all those leading research institutions so they can conduct research and promote education. What it also does is it um, helps connect different state and regional research and education networks. And I like to think of those, um, it's almost like a statewide nonprofit internet network um, in each state or region. And so those connect community anchor institutions like libraries, K-12 schools, and state and local governments and healthcare institutions to the Internet 2 uh, backbone. But what I really like about Internet 2 is it is a collaborative community that helps all these organizations that connect solve technology challenges and create innovation, innovative solutions um, for problems they wouldn't otherwise be able to solve. Now, where I work, the Community Anchor Program, we really focus on community anchor institutions. So here's a list of the, the types of community anchor institutions that connect to the Internet 2 backbone across the United States via those nonprofit research and education networks. Um, we have um, 45 state and regional research and education networks that connect. and we work with all of them to connect these uh, community anchor institutions. Some of the things we do, we work on this Tor Gigabit Libraries Toolkit. We also work on a grant from the IMLS about measuring library broadband networks in libraries. Um, and we also produce some distance learning series for um, K-12 schools called the Presidential Primary Sources Project and provide some distance learning scholarships for K-12 schools that connect to the Internet 2 backbone. And I'm Carson Block. I am now a library technology consultant. I've been doing this for about 10 years now, but I've been, you know, I've been working with library technology since the web was just a little itty bitty teeny baby in libraries. So I've had the benefit of kind of growing up with um, some of the uh, issues that have come from having internet and, and web, uh, wonderful, tremendous resources, tremendous uh, opportunities that we have, and also lots of gaps, right? And so um, that's what I have done. Um, I've been, uh, I do all sorts of, of, of technology work. In fact, one of my very large clients is the Miami-Dade uh, uh, system um, uh, in Florida, of course, you know this. Um, but also I work with very small libraries on a one-to-one -one basis as well, because uh, my job is to help increase the capacity of the library to serve people. That's why we have technology, right? So that's uh, that's the one thing I have in common with everything that I do, and I do lots of um, uh, lots of stuff. But it's really about uh, capacity and also things that are like complex situations. Because why else would you call someone to help you <laughs> if you can figure it out so easily yourself? When when things are a little rough. Um, that's when I get a call to help with that. And this project is one of uh, maybe my top, maybe my top one that I've ever had the pleasure to work with because it's been so effective. And that's why we're so, uh, so excited here, Stephanie and I, to tell you about this because we want you to grab this and use it. Great. And so before we jump into telling you a little more about the toolkit, we wanted to get to know you a little bit. So we're going to ask you a few questions and we're going to compare your answers to what our initial grants 58 toolkit pilot sites said in their post visit survey. So um, we asked them things like their level of expertise and what support they had for tech and broadband issues. So um, we will ask kind of the same questions 
to you guys. Um, this is our first poll question, if we could get that put up. It is up. All right, oh. great. So it's how would you classify your library? Would you say it's a rural, urban, tribal, suburban, or a K-12 or academic library? And we're going to be watching these tally as they come in because um, this is an exciting part <laughs> of the program for us because this is one of the chances we get to talk to you. We love being live in person. We know so many other people do, and, and uh, this is one of those ways that uh, we're able to kind of get feedback uh, from you. Uh, but we also invite any questions that you have in the chat column, uh, the chat box. Just put them in there, and we'll, uh, we'll address things as we go. Just think of this as a nice, casual uh, sort of um, uh, time together. And I think, I think we'll have some tallied results here in a moment. Moment. I'm not sure I see those yet. Here we go. The tally is in. 57%, uh, uh, our largest percent, is suburban libraries. You think of yourself as a sub suburban library, followed by 28% urban libraries, 14% rural libraries. And so that's our that's our three that we have here. Mostly suburban, uh, almost 57%, uh, 28% urban libraries, and 14% rural libraries. Great. So that is good to know. Here's a question. Um, and this might vary, you know, depending on where you are and how much support you have, but how frequently is technical or IT support available in your library? Is, would you say it's available anytime, only when problems arise? Or would you say even less than that, probably very infrequently or limited, or just it's never available? You know, Stephanie, I think sometimes people think that's a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> but it is not a trick question. In fact, it's an example of the, the approach that we take in the toolkit. Um, the toolkit is actually as easy as it is to, to answer uh, these simple questions in order to lead to solutions. So we'll, we'll tell you more about that. Uh, as we proceed. And also, we're really excited to see the, the amount of suburban libraries here as well, um, mm -hmm. because we are looking at uh, adding more um, uh, uh, outreach into urban, suburban uh, library situations. And the poll results are ready. 50% of folks on the call um, or the webinar uh, have access any time that they need it. 37 percent though 40 percent almost as many have only when problems arise and more importantly this because this is who we're the most concerned about is 12 percent very infrequently or limited wow okay all right so the way this compared to the folks that we used for the, the original toolkit, and again, we're expanding it. So everyone on this call is actually um, uh, somebody that we're outreaching to now. But just put yourself in the past just a couple of years. We, th th these were folks that we, we visited. And as you can see from this chart, only a, f a small sliver in this case, uh, less than 12% had tech support available anytime. The others varying degrees of infrequency or not at all. So that's, uh, uh, that is, we wanted to make sure we were going to the right folks to make sure to test this toolkit out with those in the most need. Definitely. And here is our last poll question for you. Describe your current level of expertise around procuring and delivering access to broadband as a service in your library. So would you say you're very experienced, um, like you've been responsible for maybe ordering and setting up the internet connection, or you feel like you have a good understanding of the troubleshooting process? Um, would you say it's limited, like you've had some experience, maybe I've called them a few times, helped troubleshoot some things, but I don't feel like an expert still, or just no experience, kind of someone said it and then you forget it, right? It's, it's just, it works, <laughs> varying degrees of, uh, you know, satisfaction, yes. but you don't have to deal with the internet. So um, let and us that, know. That's one of the most interesting. I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I was just going to say that's one of the most interesting things about um, our uh, some of our larger libraries is if you have an IT department, you may not have to worry about that at all. On the other hand, if you're in a smaller library or even a suburban library, this might be one of your the, one of the things on your plate. Mm -hmm. And those results are coming in. I can feel it from across the country. We have. <laughs> 
Well, this is great. We have we have we have some ringers in here. Actually, fifty percent of those on our webinar are very experienced. That's awesome. Thirty-seven percent have limited experience, and twelve percent have no experience. So this is really interesting. We've got a nice balance of those who feel very experienced um, versus those with uh, less uh, uh, experience, limited to no. Yes, and Carson, tell us how that compares to who we worked with in the pilot. So in a stark contrast to the wonderful folks watching the <laughs> webinar today, only a very small sliver had, were, felt very experienced. The vast majority were, uh, uh, fifth, almost 51% of those we worked with had limited experience and 44 had no experience at all. And can you imagine what it's like to have no experience and be uh, and having uh, the internet technology being a core part of your services and not quite knowing what to do with it? Well, that's why we have the toolkit. And now we're gonna give you a little overview of the toolkit and I will say whether you were part of that 50% very experienced, 37% uh, limited or 12% no experience, what's great is the toolkit really works for everybody. Yeah, I, I was going to, I, I really appreciate you saying that, Stephanie. The, the One of the things that the toolkit has opened up, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but we want to emphasize it right now, is that it has opened up communication channels between folks, especially tech, tech folks who have lots of experience with this and library staff who have no experience experience uh, uh, with uh, technology at all. It's helped create uh, dialogue because we're able to get folks on the same uh, understanding of concepts and terminology and things like that. Now, to get the free toolkit, you can download it at internet2.edu forward slash TGL. And I have to say something funny for the advanced tech folks uh, in the audience. I keep hearing on national shows and podcasts people describing the forward slash as a backslash. Um, <laughs> it is so great. Anyway, geek humor for you. Um, also, uh, we have a, a URL. This is also available at that easy to, to remember uh, address, internet2.edu forward slash TGL. This is a, a, a short explainer video uh, on the toolkit. We want you to check it out. It, this thing has had 1,200 views. It was the only way that we thought we'd be able to communicate about this after the first grant uh, ended. We had no idea that we'd be able to continue this program. So it has, uh, it's been the one consistent piece of communication going forward. It's been very effective. And if you want to share more about this webinar uh, with others in a shorter way, you can have them look at that first before digging in to more details. Great. The toolkit itself is three things at the same time. Uh, this is even sounds more complex than it actually plays out. <laughs> but if you look at it, it's an educational workbook. Um, it's clearly that. Um, but it's also a self-assessment tool. It's a way for any layperson on up to have a way to approach doing things like an inventory and, and effectiveness. And it's also an advocacy tool because the more that, that anyone understands about uh, any topic, especially technology in libraries, the more they can take advantage of opportunities to advocate, advocate for improvements. And I'll tell you from the libraries I've worked with, from the very smallest to the very largest, including one in your state, everyone wants to improve and everyone needs to find that path to improve. Definitely. And let me tell you a little bit about the toolkit components and process. Here, um, in the different bullet points you're going to see are kind of different areas the toolkit covers. So it's everything from taking an inventory of what kind of technology is in the library, what computers do you have, what um, other supporting devices do you have, what's your modem look like. Um, so things like your broadband connection, your Wi-Fi network, um, and looking at your broadband technology and operations support those people supporting you as well. Um, it also takes a look at broadband funding. We could always use more money, right? And uh, has some additional resources and best practices. And just the process for creating the toolkit was, like we said, we went to some pilot sites. They did completed an intake survey. You'll see those arrows along the bottom. Um, there was a pilot visit where we went through the toolkit with them which led to creating the broadband improvement plan that is part of the toolkit you can download for free. And then they completed a post-pilot survey, which is where you saw some of the numbers from there. Then this, the uh, toolkit, sorry, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. 
<laughs> Stephanie. I thought, okay. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, it's so much fun to do this from different parts of the planet <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> Uh, we, the toolkit approach is designed deliberately to be super easy to use. So um, it's simple. Within each section, there is a question, and then there is a resource to help you answer that question. So in this example, this is asking, what sort of internet connection do you have? And then the next section says, or, or describes what those, those are. We've done this for every question uh, in hopes that no one would be lost in trying to uh, complete the toolkit. In, you know, and again, this is free, it's open source. Uh, so many folks have taken it and remixed it. We'll tell you a little bit more about, about those efforts in a little bit. Um, but it's a tech learning, diagnostic, and advocacy tool. There's many ways to use this for everyone at every level. One is to record a shareable snapshot of your library's IT and broadband infrastructure. I can tell you as a technology consultant in libraries for 10 years, the condition of inventories and just having that snapshot is not as nice or as high as we'd like to have across the country. And it's the, the essential piece of uh, planning and growing from that. So it helps with that. It also helps folks prepare for E-rate requests and budget cycles because, you know, you might not pursue uh, either if you don't don't know you need something, well, the toolkit helps point that out and it has time and time again for folks who've used it. It also helps open the communication channels between the tech side of the house and the library side of the house. I'm saying that with air quotes, but even if you have uh, vendors, if you have um, an IT staff or you have a volunteer maybe in smaller libraries to help you with your technology, this helps open those lines of communication so that everyone's on the same page. And then of course, it addresses specific problems. It's very specific in the areas that we explore. So there's a lot of meat to it and a lot of uh, takeaways. Uh, and also you can get a baseline of proposed IT um, broadband improvements that you wanna make. The best part for toolkit users, there is no technology experience required. You don't need to be a techie to dive into this. In fact, what we've seen is that non-techies have dived into it and suddenly they feel a little techie. So now we'll go into how we developed the toolkit. Um, we did a number of pilot that will look on the um, uh, close to, um, I was 58 uh, visits to rural and tribal libraries. So if you look at the dots on the, on the map there, the blue ones are mostly public libraries. The orange ones are mostly uh, tribal libraries. The ones in Alaska, of course, there's uh, uh, some of a mix uh, up there uh, in, in, in how they're officially designated, but, but we tried to get to as many tribal libraries as we could. Uh, we, had, we were able to engage 70 library staff from across the US and every one of these folks contributed to the toolkit that you see now because we have this philosophy of iteration and improvement and so we never we, we never wrote the toolkit and said it's done including today it's not done um, we listened to feedback because we wanted it to be effective that was our main goal and um, and I think that's why we have something we enjoyed using we also had an advisory board of 20 subject matter experts from across the US and they held our feet to the fire. We had arguments, good, the good kind, where for the, what is usually considered highly technical information and make it friendly enough for a layperson to understand. And what we found out is that it was pretty effective. The next slide shows us the feedback from our post pilot visit survey. And this was, important to, uh, you know, we didn't survey people to death. These were you know, simple, short things. But we were so worried about wasting people's time, especially in a very small library. You have somebody coming in off the road, they're interrupting your day, and you know, it better be worth it because <laughs> there's always something else that needs to be done. And so we were very pleased to see uh, folks rate their overall experience very highly according to this this chart. And, and keep in mind, when we would walk in, sometimes people would eyeball us and not be sure they wanted to spend any time on anything technology related. This is our favorite slide, of course. Would you recommend this pilot process to other libraries? 
Uh, folks who work in libraries know how elusive it is for there to be a unanimous anything. <laughs> You're right. And so the fact that every participant that that were yep, we would recommend this gave us a lot of confidence that we were on the right track. Definitely. And we got some and great. Stephanie, yeah. Go ahead. This was the new slide this time. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. This is cool. Go, go, go. Sure. Um, so we got some great feedback in the post pilot visit survey, and here's just some quotes about it. Um, people really saying, you know, it helped me understand my library's broadband infrastructure better and feel more confident. That's what we kept hearing is feeling more confident, talking about what's going on when it relates to IT and broadband in my library. And, you know, the goal of the toolkit is like you look at that second quote to be educational and helpful. So what was great is just going through the process, people felt like they learned more, and also the physical printouts and sheets to refer to and use as a reference. People were saying, you know, as somebody who's about to retire, I went through and did this, and then I could present it to my successor and say, like, here is the landscape for the IT and broadband in our library was something that was very valuable. And also just printing off a document and being able to walk over to the room with the wires in it and start writing things down. Uh -huh. um, it's very practical. Um, it's very effective. And I loved um, the, the third quote here. There is a visual diagram in the um, toolkit that pictures how internet service works. And so the different steps, you know, it takes before the internet gets to the computer. So it really breaks it down on that level, which um, was just, you know, it's, it's great feedback to hear and hopefully gives you a picture of how maybe you could use the toolkit in your library. So what was so great is, you know, we had this grant in 2015. It lasted for two years plus a one-year extension. So 2018 rolls around. The toolkit didn't stop working then, which is why we got this second grant. Um, what's been amazing is so many organizations have kind of picked up the toolkit, made it their own. It's got a Creative Commons license, so you can, you know, take it, remix it. Um, just one of the examples, um, that happened is the Montana State Library picked up the toolkit and actually um, hired a consultant to um, go through and use the toolkit in 115 of its 117 libraries across the state of Montana. And it really helped them understand the bigger picture of the state's library IT and broadband needs. So, for example, federal guidelines recommend libraries that serve up to 50,000 people should have a minimum of 100 megabits per second connection. And they found that fewer than five of those Montana libraries actually met that federal guideline level. And so they found that 30% actually connect at less than 10 megabits per second. So they are working um, with Dr. Colin Reinsmith out of Simmons University School of Library and Information Science actually to produce a report to the state that's going to help, you know, influence um, Montana libraries, broadband and IT needs going forward. So that's kind of what uh, one big picture impact of the toolkit. Um, in Arkansas, they, um, the state library incorporated the toolkit into some trainings and tied it to an upcoming E-rate cycle. So that was really cool because libraries use the toolkit um, to become, become more confident about kind of going out and assessing their equipment and what they needed and walking through the toolkit and they reported feeling more empowered after they completed it. In Pennsylvania, the Kinber uh, organization, which is one of those uh, research and education networks, those r &E networks that Stephanie told us about, uh, partnered with the state library to create a series of trainings that were based uh, uh, partly on the toolkit and then a whole bunch of other relevant technology related topics. Because what happens is, you know, when you work through the toolkit and some of those basics, suddenly you start understanding the more advanced topics. And those advanced topics really come down to improving broadband capacity within libraries. So Kinber has been uh, super active in that. They've got a, a, also a new project uh, coming up this year for uh, many libraries in Pennsylvania. Also, the state of South Dakota used this in, in much the same way 
um, in terms of bringing up the basis of training um, and knowledge within South Dakota. And in fact, the toolkit helped during CARES Act funding. Uh, many libraries in South Dakota do not uh, uh, partake in the E-rate program, as it turned out. CARES Act funding required, uh, as E-rate requires, CARES Act funding required compliance with the Children's Internet Protection Act, in other words, filled to be part of the library's approach for or for things like that. And so the toolkit was used to diagram the network and understand how filtering worked and where it might go and to talk about whether or not it was worth it to receive the, uh, that funding. Uh, in Nebraska, Nebraska is our poster child for the perfect partnership between an r and &E network and the state library. We had a member of each uh, of those organizations, part of our uh, very first visit. It was actually our very first kickoff visit. And these two had never worked together before. And uh, they had lots of dashboard time. They found that they had so much in common. They found that they had uh, complementary uh, strengths. Some of them were identical because they're both technology experts, but also different strengths because of the different expertise and thinking. And that has spawned different grant pro uh, programs and incredible changes to the state of Nebraska. All right, so we've told you all about, you know, why we think the toolkit's successful, some of the great ways some big organizations have done it. And now we're going to kind of drill down and look at the specific sections of the toolkit and really, um, want you guys to be thinking about how the different toolkit sections might be able to help your library. So feel free to, you know, put into the chat or raise your hand if you have a question about different sections. But we're going to give you kind of a broad overview of what the six sections of the toolkit look like. And then there's also a broadband improvement plan. And after that, we're going to give you some tips and takeaways to walk away with um, even before you crack open the toolkit. So Carson, tell us about this first section of the toolkit. Yeah, so you got you, you can't do anything unless you know where you're starting. <laughs> so the first <laughs> section is a technology inventory. This is essentially walking around, counting things, measuring how fast things work, looking at things like your broadband connection, the different devices that make up your network, uh, looking at your wired network and the power for that, looking at wireless networks and power, and also thinking about those end user computing devices. That's the purpose of our network, right, is to, to, to create access for our wireless, uh, Wi-Fi sorts of things, and also things that need to be connected with a wire. Definitely. And what I love about this technology inventory is it reminds us, I have the, for, I'm fortunate, I get to work with a lot of research and education networks, which provide what I would say, you know, I'm biased, obviously, excellent internet connectivity to uh, internet yeah. But even if your library is connected with Florida Lambda Rail, which is the research and education network in Florida, if your computers are old, if your wires are, you know, are janky, there's different reasons that <laughs> the broadband isn't working or the IT isn't working in your library. And this is a great section to go to to kind of figure it out. <laughs> the next section is broadband services and activities. And so it really, you know, covers services and applications. So figuring out if you have sufficient bandwidth. So there's a link to an article in there that talks about kind of target bandwidth that your organization ideally would have to support patron and staff use of um, different devices. But it also talks about, you know, whether you have hotspot lending, what kind of filtering you're using, what kind of services you're offering to people. And what I really like is it kind of asks you the question, when, you know, when we talked about this is also a tool for advocacy, a tool for planning. It asks you, you know, what would you do if you weren't constrained by those broadband limitations? So would you be planning more distance learning? Would you be doing virtual field trips and events or online job trainings for people? Um, would you make a, do a maker space? Different things like that. So it really helps you kind of think outside of your current situation. One oft forgotten piece of the chain are people. <laughs> in the technology discussion yes. and right and you know i have to say that in 90 percent of my work it's uh when we get to the last 10 percent, which is the actual technology stuff it's usually pretty easy 90 percent are the people things uh, leading up to that all the, the the human dynamics and so this addresses actually the folks 
who are available or not available to help you with your technology support. Uh, it looks at um, uh, ways to figure out if, if uh, you can improve your relationship with people, uh, look at staff training resources, looking at the technical support available to you from your internet service provider. A lot of people don't know that they can call upon their internet service provider when they're having difficulties. Uh, they just they just say, well, things are bad, but but no, there's ways to, to approach that. Uh, there's also ways to, to approach looking at the level of service that you're getting and ensuring that you're getting a great level of service. In fact, getting what you're buying, uh, getting everything that you're paying for. So in, in our tips and tricks section coming up, we're going to show you uh, kind of how to do that. Yeah. And so the next section um, covers broadband funding. So what's great is, it, you know, as you kind of look, what I, what I say is it's great. It, it kind of gets asked you to look at your broadband contact contract and think about things like, you know, how much do you actually pay for your connection? What's the service cost? Do you, do you rent any devices? Um, are, what kind of taxes are you paying? Um, asking a few more questions about your E-rate funding situation. And if you do take advantage of it, you know, why, what are you using it for? Um, and then other funding sources, you know, are there state, local, or private grants that might be available to help you? Um, and this is one of the sections we're working on updating now because obviously um, all the funding opportunities are becoming available um, to that. But really using this information in this section will help you understand your funding landscape, you know, what you have now, but also what's out there um, to potentially go for. Because we know that everything in libraries relates, <laughs> we live in a very interrelated service environment and resources environment. Uh, we have a section for additional resources and best practices. The reason library technology exists is simple. It's to serve our communities in our unique ways. And we all have a very, uh, I always that, that's a wrong way to say very unique. We each have unique service opportunities and the way that we express those service opportunities. So we wanted to make sure we had some resources that would fit you if you wanted to learn more about E-rate, for instance, or content filtering, um, additional broadband 101 resources, training opportunities that don't cost anything. Now, I know that during COVID, we've had a plethora of those. However, before COVID, and I think after uh, COVID runs its course, uh, we may um, we may forget. There may not be as many current ones uh, available, but there's a lot of uh, great uh, ways to, to learn about things. Also, things like data backup, data backup, if you're not back Backing up your data. I'm here to remind you to back up your data. And, <laughs> internet, and uh, internet use policies. That's a common question that comes up um, because we, we are public institutions for the most part. And that means that we need to also have a policy framework uh, to uh, rely on to help our boards, to help us, and to help our patrons as we go forward. Definitely. And here for, you know, we said no techies necessary to fill out this um, toolkit, and that's why one of the sections is a glossary. It's got terms like Ethernet, firewall, latency, router, wireless access point, different terms um, that you can always look up in the glossary if you have a question. Um, we've got you know a nice sourced answer for you. Um, we're also working, one of the great feedback we got from our current advisory board for our current grant is um, some advice to add some maybe pictures or pricing to this glossary. So as we work on the toolkit and improving it, you will see this section probably changing in the coming months. Um, so those are the main sections. Before we get to the broadband improvement plan part of the section, we just um, wanted to show some common issues that people would discover after they went through the toolkit. So looking at these different issues, you know, please feel free to put in the chat, like, is your issue listed here? Did, do, are you suspecting if you went through the toolkit, would you find insufficient bandwidth in your library? Um, would you find that your, you know, equipment might be a little out of date or obsolete? Um, do you have dead spots in the library? Um, are you guys not participating? participating in e-rate because of you know maybe it's taking too much time or you're not quite sure what it would pay for um, right, right. you know if you have any ideas or um, things you want to share please feel free to put them in the chat um, 
and we'll be able to call them out as we go along. But I want Carson to talk a little bit about the last part of the toolkit, and arguably this very important part of it, <laughs> um, the broadband yeah. improvement plan. That's right. So you might think, great, I, I just found out I had more problems than I thought. Now what? And uh, this is the idea is to organize those in a way that uh, is doable and achievable and makes good logical sense. And so for the purposes of the toolkit, uh, we created what's called the broadband improvement plan. The first section of this is the short term action plan. This is the stuff that maybe should have been addressed yesterday. <laughs> and so <laughs> we put zero to three months. Um, on that, followed by something more like three to 12 months in terms of its implementation. Uh, if you're used to project management, you know that you, to fix something, you can't do everything at once. You've got to break down the, the initial steps with the middle steps with the final steps. And so this is a way to get a handle on doing an improvement. Like for instance, in, in the case of this one here, uh, this library had poor Wi-Fi coverage at the front of the library because its Wi-Fi uh, antenna, its radio was re uh, located in the back of the library. So of course, uh, because of the, through the tool it, they learned that there's a, a, an issue with distance. Wi-Fi is just doesn't go on and on forever. It actually has uh, limits to the range that it can cover. We the, the immediate thing was let's move this thing to the middle of the library. And to do that, uh, we also have to put in a new Ethernet cable so that we can actually move that device someplace more centrally located for better service. Uh, when we're looking at more longer term um, uh, sorts of things, we might we might say, hey, you know, we discovered that our our, our internet service is not that great. We're not that happy with it. So we need to start exploring other options so that we have better internet service. After all, we're responsible for providing. So our internet has to be the very best it can be. So a couple of examples. Definitely. And so uh, I think sometimes one of the most intimidating things is actually downloading that toolkit. That's why we include the link to it. Um, I would suggest you just download it, save it or print it, and check it out on your own. We're going to give you today two things you can do actually right away before you even crack open the toolkit to learn more about the broadband in your library. Um, the very first thing, and some of you may do this at your own home, as if you're working from home like I am, um, is conducting a speed test. Um, this is, um, these are links to two different speed tests. Um, there is a lot of them out, out there, but here's just two um, common ones that we've used before. One is the Euclid speed test, speedtest.net, and one is the MLAB speed test made by Measurement Lab. Um, so I took a couple pictures as I was running speed tests from my home internet network. So I use Comcast. I'm out. I, I'm based out of Ann Arbor, Michigan. So um, you'll see that the the picture of the Ookla speed test is where it was measuring my upload speed, which isn't great. I think I I pay for more upload speed than that. But um, another day at a different time of day, I ran the MLAB speed test, and you'll see. Um, the download speed was a little faster when I ran it that day, but um, this is just to show you, you know, you can run different tests. Um, the upload and download speeds might be different when you take them at different times of day. That's why we actually recommend um, if you're running a speed test, run, you can run more than one speed test at multiple times a day on different days of the week and record them using this free download we're including a link to in this slide. So tell us a little more, bit more about that, Carson. Yeah, so the, the, this is something that is deceptively simple. You might say, so, so what? So I'm running some tests, I'm writing it down, what's the big deal? I'll tell you what the big deal is, is if you uh, have encountered like this thing where you think, oh, our internet's slow, or our internet is janky, <laughs> Stephanie, <laughs> You know, we need to add that to the glossary, Stephanie. I'm making a note right now. It's an official term. Yes, <laughs> janky. Um, <laughs> let's say it's janky, and but you can't put your finger on it. Well, one strategy to use to improve that is to simply uh, log the results that you get from running a, a speed test at a consistent time over several days. So the best time to do this for most libraries is first thing in the morning, as soon as somebody gets there and before you're reasonably sure that there's no one else using the line in significant ways. So in other words, um, you know, before you open the doors and patrons start using uh, internet service, uh, of course, 
course, if you're offering Wi-Fi uh, outside, that can change that, right? Uh, that, that, that can make a difference. But in general, first thing in the morning, test it uh, same day and look at the patterns that you see maybe over three to four to five days these columns here uh, are all these uh, ways to measure this and also measure it from two different services. That's why we suggest a commercial service uh, like Ookla and a uh, nonprofit service like MLab because then you get an idea of, of, of the range that you're, you're using from different services. If indeed these speed tests consistently show that your, your service is not working, you send this to your and say, hey, we have a problem that we need to work on because you have sold us a line at a you're not receiving that speed according to this. Can you help us resolve this problem? And believe it or not, we're not do that. They appreciate that uh, when you're able to provide data. They also uh, really um, know that you know what you're talking about, right? When you're able to do a measurement and ship you suddenly have something, you've described the problem, you've been able to repeat it. Another thing that could happen when you do this is maybe your internet speed is faster <laughs> than you thought. Mm -hmm. And that means, that might mean you've got another problem. <laughs> but it all starts with like this in a consistent way. The next fun thing that you might want to do is we have a couple of, of um, uh, apps that are listed there on the, on the left. Um, we're not in things, but we are referring these uh, as possible when to use. And then on the screen, you see a third app uh, called Wi-Fi Analyzer. This runs on the Apple platform. And it's something that I run on my laptop when I'm doing site visits. This is a way to take that invisible thing called Wi-Fi and make it visible. You can see every single Wi-Fi access at this point within the range, readable range of your device that's recording it and you can learn things like how strong is the signal am I overlapping is my signal overlapping with another strong signal because that can create conflicts with Wi-Fi and very poor performance if you've got two competing Wi-Fi hotspots close to each other fighting for that same signal um, it can they can kind of cancel each other out or, or create real issues with things um, it also tells you a lot about the Wi-Fi signal itself itself about how fast it can go um, it's um, at the different megahertz ranges that are being used. And of course, we've got a brand new thing out called Wi-Fi 6, which is the newest generation of Wi-Fi. It's supposed to help uh, solve some of these problems. But haven't you heard that forever <laughs> about every new technology that comes out? And yet we still are fighting with the same things. Well, that's OK. That's just part of technology. But a tool like this helps us measure things. And one of the things that uh, was the most fun for folks who we did site visits for is we would take this Wi-Fi stumbler out. We would find the library's Wi-Fi um, uh, access point and then walk around and see where it was hot and performing really well and likewise where it was what we call attenuated or it was not, um, uh, the signal was horrible or poor. And anecdotally, people knew, like, like it's like, yeah, every time, never works. Well, this shows you why. And we were able to think about things like, are there a lot of metal shelves between your Wi-Fi access point and the place maybe where you have patrons seated? Well, those those metal shelves are going to deflect uh, and complicate that radio from working correctly, both mm -hmm. on your uh, receiving device and the Wi-Fi access point. So that's, that's an example of how anyone can use um, a, a Wi-Fi stumbler to see what is invisible. Thank you. And so really use these Wi-Fi stumblers, use the speed tests. Those are two ways you can kind of check out some great things in your library before you crack open the toolkit. And we're hoping it just inspires you to pick it up and say, OK, I know I have this one issue. Maybe I should at least go through this one section of the toolkit. So um, obviously, we just started our two-year IMLS grant in September of 2020. So now I just want to tell you about kind of the next steps we're taking. Um, 
we are working on updating the Toward Gigabit Libraries Toolkit. That's not to say you can't download it right now and use it, I will say. We're just in the next few months, we're going to be updating, you know, any broken links we find, technology references and resources. Um, we are working with a 40-person strong advisory board of experts um, in library science, in tribal libraries, rural libraries, urban libraries. Um, and digital inclusion throughout the US. And so they have been giving us some fabulous advice on um, different ways to improve the toolkit. So we're working with that advisory board um, to identify improve, improvements to the toolkit and also um, work on our outreach to tribal, rural, and urban libraries. And suburban, you know, you guys are included in that as well. Um, one of the things we're working on. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, one of the things we discovered from our wonderful advisory board is that when we're thinking about uh, urban tech deserts, it's more, it's less likely that it's someplace, you know, again, like uh, Miami-Dade, because they have got a top-notch technology organization uh, uh, serving um, uh, them. And, and of course, there, there's always things that, that they're working on there, and they're such a great organization. But there's other library systems right so they're 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 semi-urban they're around other urban cores and they're struggling with technology as well and so that's where so far we've been advised to look to help with uh, connecting the toolkit to those folks yeah and, and one of the things we'll be working on too is developing some train the trainer seminars and really working on how we can support libraries interested in completing the toolkit so having sessions where people you know will walk you through um working on the toolkit and um, helping people get the word out about it as well. Um, so really how to get involved right now, we would love it if you just, you know, download and use the toolkit as is, see see if it can do anything for your library. And like Carson said, it's you can go through the whole thing or you can pick the section where you know you have a problem area and just go through that one. And that's what's so great about it is that um, it's there for you. And depending on how you need it, uh, that's how you can use it. You can email me. My email address will be on the slides um, to join our email list. We're putting that together right now just to push out updates about new toolkit features um, or upcoming presentations or training sessions. So nothing super crazy. You won't be hearing from us every week or anything, but just for critical <laughs> updates and um, it, things of interest uh, that you might be uh, wanting to take advantage of. And then finally, you can follow the community anchor program on Twitter as we um, create more of a social media presence for the toolkit. You can always find um, more information there. So yeah, that's that's our presentation. We are just so grateful for the opportunity to talk to you yeah. all today. Um, we'd love you know any questions you have or comments. Um, I will say, you know, putting words in Carson's mouth, he is great at um, giving you advice or information. So if you have questions about your library and tech, um, we can tell you what we think or um, whether the toolkit might be able to help your situation. Yeah. Just, just ask. I Honestly, yeah. that, that the most fun part of the of toolkit presentations is people say, well, wait, you didn't cover this thing I'm I'm experienced. And, and so it's kind of fun to work through those things together in real time. Yeah, so, you know, you don't have to put any questions in the chat now if you're not comfortable. We have our email addresses here as well. Um, you can absolutely um, reach out to us with any questions as well there. And I will turn it over to Emily. Well, it does look like we have about five minutes left. I just have one question, and this is just out of curiosity. What was the thing that you found in your 60-odd site visits was the easiest or strangest fix that could be done? <laughs> I will let you take this one. Carson went on the, 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 the pilot visits. The the sixty of this of the sixty the easiest the easiest was when we would discover that there was a piece of equipment uh, of gear that the library had as part of their internet service that was so old that I was surprised the little blinky lights would keep blinking. <laughs> that's how old. That's how old it was, and it was obsolete.
to lead. It was it was what's uh, what we call end of life. That might be a EO, EOL is some, a term, tech term you might have heard of before. End of life is the nice way to put it. In this case, it should have been historic in a, in a museum. Um, and so we encountered that more more than once. And you know, the thing is, is a library, it, you know, it was still working. Um, it just was really slow because it was really old. And so that was the easiest fix. The, 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 the weirdest one was so much fun to sleuth out. We were in a downtown area in a, in a small community, but not tiny. It was maybe uh, not a medium sized town, but, but not, not a tiny, tiny town. And the library was getting its internet pr uh, services from a, uh, from a minutes. And we traced down the wiring and how the library was getting its wiring. Because the first thing I noticed when we were in there is that the Wi-Fi access points, there were several different brands that were being used, which is usually a sign that it's been hobbled, <laughs> hobbled together over time. Um, there's nothing wrong. It, it can be used that way. But usually when you've got more than one access point, one a Wi-Fi uh, a point of access, you need to have the same system to make them more manageable. So that, that's where my little alarm went off a little bit. But what we discovered is that the internet for the library actually came in um, to the from the city. The city was actually getting that internet connection and then sharing it with the library. And it was spread out over, oh, I would say a thousand feet um, of plugging one um, a switch, one sharing a signal in her switch until it finally got to the library. And then when it got to the library, there was not adequate wiring in the building. And so there were um, uh, other switches and a uh, switch is a, a, a multiple access area to plug in lots and lots of ethernet cords and which is in just one spot and what's called home run, bring all the wiring back to one spot in the building so that it works well. Plugging one switch into another switch into another switch creates, um, it's like I'm taking a photocopier and copying a picture and then copying that picture and then copying that picture. It starts degrading. So that was the that was the strangest one. We mapped and I said, uh, places where I did a very detailed map, that was one where I said, Um, they fixed it. Yeah, and I would say um, the other one is you can have a great Wi-Fi signal, but if your walls are made of Adobe, um, that doesn't help with the Wi-Fi signal. I don't know if you want to say anything more about that, Carson. Yeah, totally. So, you know, Adobe is this awesome, beautiful construction technique that's used in the Southwest. And Adobe uses a wireframe as part of its core covered in mud. Guess what wire does? It helps block radio waves. And so um, and combined with that earth, um, we, we, we discovered that uh, one library wanted to offer Wi-Fi signal outside the library. And we knew that the best place to put that Wi-Fi access point was the window because of the Adobe walls attenuating. <laughs> the signal. <laughs> and it looks like we are about wrapped up. Yeah. I do think that that is a great place to end it. And uh, thank you guys so much uh, for being with us today and, and sharing your stories and especially sharing this incredible resource. I know that so many of people who are, are interested in improving their infrastructure in their libraries um, perhaps have taken an unusual path to get into that role and uh, yeah. really <laughs> will be able to benefit from from some of the self-directed and, and really judgment-free <laughs> resources made right. available here with this toolkit. So. All right, well, we are going to end this presentation now. I will stay on the line and uh, Carson and Stephanie in case we have any other questions, but I think this is where we will wrap it up. Wonderful, thank you so thank much. You so, thank you.